Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about lipids and actually are going to be three sections for this chapter, chapter five, three different lectures. You won't be seeing me because I had surgery yesterday and I'm feeling a bit under the weather and I don't want to scare you with my appearance. So are lipids and fats different or are they one and the same? We know that there's a large diverse group of lipids and dietary fats belong within that lipid group. We know that lipids are insoluble in water and the common dietary fats include triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. Why do we need dietary fat? Well, it is good for us in the right amounts. Remember, the dose makes the poison. I always like to say that. Essential fatty acids carry our fat-soluble vitamins A, E, D, and K. It's an important component of cell membranes. Uh, fat, dietary fats help prevent growth deficiencies. And it serves as a padding or protection and insulation uh, for our vital organs. When we get a, a little nervous about that is when folks have central adiposity and they have an excess of fat around those major vital organs. We know that that's uh, detrimental to one's health. They're a valuable source of energy, nine calories per gram. And they make food taste good, basically. provides mouth mouthfeel to foods is the food science term. So approximately 25 to 35 percent of your total calories that you ingest in a day should come from fat. And again, it's, our, it's how we store energy because it's so rich in calories. I always like this example because I think it, it helps you understand um, the fuel source of fat and how we use it. If you're a 150 pound man, you have about 60,000 to 100,000 calories. So a, a month or two supply of fuel for fat. So I go back to some of these challenges where people are dropped off in remote climates or environments and they have to survive getting their own food and again the before and after anthropometrics are, are, are dramatic and these people tap into their fat sources because their their glycogen uh, stores have long been catabolized and the body moves on to the next fuel they have an infinite storage capacity that is adipose cells if you've ever watched discovery health channel has my 800 pound life, my 600 pound life, um, those folks, adipose cells continue to grow and grow and grow and grow, infinite storage capacity. There's three classes of fats that we're gonna talk about. Triglycerides, which we get from our food, is a major form of fat in food. You remember, they have a glycerol backbone and three fatty acids attached. And lecithin, or phospholipids is a major constitu a constituent of the cell membrane, and that's made by the liver, but it's also found in certain foods. So when we talk about fat, we usually think about the length of their um, chains. We have short, medium, and long fatty acid chains, and you can see how many carbons in each chain. The medium and long chains take longer to digest, um, and, and be absorbed. The short chain fatty acids we use with people who uh, have difficulty absorbing fats. The, I was just talking about triglycerides. So the glycerol backbone of a triglyceride is an alcohol composed of three carbon atoms. And we went over that in gluconeogenesis as well. And then of course we have the fatty acid chains attaching to these three carbons to make a triglyceride. The Hydrogen bond determines the shape and function of a lipid. So each atom has four attachment sites and it won't be stable until it's bonded with four other atoms or all four sites actually have a bond. The hydrogen determines that shape. So this is a picture of a, a saturated fatty acid. Note that there are not any double bonds. So each attachment site is always filled by hydrogen atom, you can see that the hydrogen is in the blue. And there's at, there's nowhere in this structure, this molecule, um, where there's a double bond, no double bonds. That makes a saturated fatty acid. And hence the name, the chain is fully saturated with hydrogen. And there's a different way of portraying the structure. And I think most people are familiar where saturated fat comes from or sources of uh, saturated fat butter, cream, whole milk, whole dairy, beef, coconut oil, which is all the craze right now, but it's still saturated fatty acid. And the saturated fatty acids we know um, can lead to uh, heart disease, more so than cholesterol, in fact.
to saturated fatty acids that do us in. Unsaturated fatty acids have uh, double bonds. Two carbons or more have a double bond. Monounsaturated fatty acids have one double bond and that creates uh, kink in the chain. So we saw the saturated fatty acid, which was a nice straight line um, in the MUFAs, we have a kink. They're liquid at room temperature. I think you're familiar probably with some of the examples. Olive oil for cooking, peanuts, avocado is a wonderful source of unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, olives, almonds, all the things, the good things. And again, if you notice in this picture, the double you can see the carbon double bond. Polyunsaturated fatty acids have more than one double bond, and they're liquid at room temperature as well. So again, all vegetable oils contain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids except coconut oil and palm oil, which even though they're vegetable oils, they are in fact saturated. And you can see that there's two double bonds. So there's always, for uh, PUFA, they always have at least two double bonds in the structure. And this illustrates what I was talking about with the kink and the unsaturated fatty acids. You can see the cis double bond, and that's what causes the bending, whereas in the saturated fatty acid, it's linear. It's a nice stick of butter right there. Again, just portraying the, the, the confirmation uh, which creates whether or not there's a kink in the structure based on the double bonds or where that kink might occur actually. Cis fatty acids have atoms or radicals on the same side of the double bond. So if you look at this picture, um, the cis fatty acid, you can see that the hydrogen are on the same side of the bond, whereas in the trans fatty acid, they're on opposite ends. Um, we will talk briefly about trans fatty acids. All fatty acids and naturally occurring lipids are in the cis form. So again, trans fatty acids are man-made, does not occur in nature, let's just put it that way. So trans fatty acids, like I said, they're manufactured using a partial hydrogenation process. They're structurally similar to saturated fats and behave in that way. So, you know, there is a push to get uh, in the um, food industry, get the trans fatty acids out of the foods, and a lot of them have just substituted with saturated fats. I don't, I don't understand, but that's the way it is in the food industry. If you remember, which I'm not, I'll be, I'll be uh, giving away my age, but in the 90s, there was a push to uh, make everything low fat. And it still had to be palatable to sell and for people to eat it. So they ended up putting a tremendous amount of added sugar in. So, you know, we take these things in and out, these what are believed to be uh, substances that are less than ideal for us in terms of health and substitute something else. I, it's, it's interesting. So the margarine and shortening contain, contain trans fatty acids, cake mixes, commercial bakery products, things of that nature. Intake of tr uh, trans fatty acids in a typical American diet are two to 3% of calories or five grams per day. And the hydrogenation of course, straightens out the chain and makes the liquid more fat. Um, again, the appearance is like that of a saturated fatty acid. It looks like I've got some logos, so ignore those. Um, again, fast food industry um, had been using trans fatty acids. Uh, they are now, a lot of them are now, now advertising that they've taken the trans fatty acids out of their products. Sterols are, is, cholesterol is essentially a sterol. It's the most commonly occurring sterol in the diet. It's made in the liver. Um, and it's only found in the fatty part of the animal. So, you know, butter, egg yolks, meats, poultry. I have to laugh. Um, I got such a kick out of one of the peanut butters saying contains no cholesterol. And I thought, well, no kidding, it's a peanut. Um, but I, I guess I wasn't aware that sometimes uh, the manufacturers are adding in saturated fat to peanut butter. That's just wrong. But I, again, you know, it's peanut butter. Why would it have cholesterol in it? I thought that little things amused me. And that is the end of the first lecture on the lipid chapter. And we will talk about lipid digestion next, followed by lipoproteins. Thank you.